Right, this is more interesting. <laughs> uh, and one of the questions I had earlier was, does art change the world? And um, yes. And, I mean, we're, I mean, we come from an industry where, well, they better have them, otherwise we're not going to get paid. I mean, literally, agencies throughout the world, there's a massive mini industry called the effectiveness industry, which you may not know about if you're not in an agency, where there's awards and presentations and proof and economic metric models to prove that when you put out cultural production and it's got certain sort of, and it hits the right targets and stuff, then people's minds do change. So brands are usually powerful. And speaking from the inside, because we work with loads of different brands at Ogilvy, maybe it'd be useful to just think about some of the strategies that are coming up. And I think there is some cause for hope, partly because people like Adidas are employing people like Ben, partly because they can't avoid some of the circularity. This is now becoming such an imperative that they, they know for the long-term growth they're going to have to do something about it. So there's just some ideas around this. Um, going back, you probably know this is the kind of truism of the environmental movement, but they say it all started with a piece of art. Not really. It was kind of an us astronauts almost a holiday snap. This wasn't on the schedule to be taken, but they all went, oh my god, look at that, quick, take a picture. And, and, and this was like December 24th, 1968, I think it's kind of poetic, it was 1968, with that year with everything that happened. And suddenly humanity got something, and this is a great sort of campaign moment, because boy did they have attention, so they, they got to the audience, they had one beautiful image, it was shot in 70 millimeter hectochrome from Hasselblad, best possible cameras of the time, you know. And they got this great shot, and no one had ever seen the marble like that before. And then we suddenly got this idea of, oh shit, we're all in the same boat. It doesn't matter whether you're from Vietnam or from America, ow, oh, we're all one nation under a groove or whatever. And then you have to confront, you're confronted with uh, uh, an interdependence and the state character, which I think became very powerful. Um, these the, the next step usually is for brands to become environmentally aware that I mean, the sustainability thing's been going on for a while. Just a couple of examples. King Fisher, which are massive and own, ca own Castorama in France and B&Q in the UK, so they do homes basically. They're really quite serious about it. And they started, they were one of the founding partners with uh, B&Q, the Helen MacArthur Foundation, she ran well, the Alps will learn. And you're absolutely right, John, the reason why sailors can think about sustainability because they're like, oh, we've only got one boat, we've got to take stuff with us. We, we can only live off what's in this boat. So it's a, kind of, it's, a, it's a kind of mentality that they carry out, which is really interesting. She always talks about that. Now, they, they've been quite serious about it, and they started promoting One Planet Home, and they spend a lot of their money, of their advertising, saying, oh, we're going to do this. But, you know, and there's a pushing of recycling and there's a pushing of the sustainability. Where do we get the resources from and the trees from the right place? You will leave it, who are absolutely massive. Far more powerful than many governments. And have much more effects. So it is really important what, you know, the marketing directors of these organisations, the commercial directors, the resourcing managers, have massive effect, really do. The head of Unilever is very, very serious about this. I mean, you, I mean it does come from the top. So there are, there are things happening, there are changes. Sustainability is, is a concern. And I think it's gone beyond the point where you can just do, people say greenwash, you can just say we're doing it. They really do have to do, because they get exposed all the time when they're, when they're not doing that stuff. Um, another example from Germany's BMW, who are not the biggest car firm in the world, but they, someone called them the first self-disruptors. You know, there's the idea of disrupting industries and uh, Silicon Valley destroying industries. BMW have done this kind of car sharing thing. They started it with SIT, which is a car hyper, and they bought them out. So they put BMW eyes and minis and they were into the electric cars as well as the two electric cars. So they're really rethinking their whole business model. And is it ownership anymore? Or is it partial ownership? Are we going to go to a subscription model? Are you just going to buy? So we don't all have to own cars because they're just sitting there on the drive doing nothing half the time. So there's all these new ways of thinking that are, you know, they're really, they are genuinely engaged with what are we going to do when that everyone has a car. And so there is change coming. I don't. I think there is uh, cause to be optimistic. 
But I think the idea of circularity is getting bigger, partly because brands have to think about the user, the consumer. And Unilever, this is over, but it's very uh, Brazil, I think, it's part of it. You know, the real beauty sketches and the whole way they've rethought God. Um, and sort of well-being and care of the ultimate end user, the consumer, sort of has become a, a real thing. And then it changes the way they represent uh, women in the adverts. And they've made these commitments now to no retouching real women, their models, uh, building body confidence. And then, you know, public commitments that they, you know, going to follow, I guess they're going to follow through on. I don't know whether you can tell or whether it really matters whether they're just doing it because they have to or whether it's just that they're doing it and, and we see a change and it helps change culture I think it's really important um, but they are I'm serious about it and they change things all the time they change the bottle and, uh, and all that sort of stuff um, so that's happening um, change things and you get this idea that brands have to have a purpose and it's the easiest thing to to kind of ridicule because sometimes it really is like news because you know cupcakes they really need a purpose you know there are a lot of brands that don't need a purpose but and Tom Goodman who's always on Twitter talking about marketing brands says you know well hang on what's the difference between he's a bit dismissive of it you know they've been standing for something representing something I'm not sure there is that much of a difference I mean if you represent in a certain way you change the culture you help the culture move on you get new ideas you convert some new ideas so people are very sneery about this, but I think brands, when they have a purpose, I think it just uh, uh, resonates more with consumers, and I think it does, does change the world. Exactly, you seem to be finding Adidas, there is a genuine impact. And they're doing it partly because they have to, to, to be relevant, to get people buying them, they want to be relevant, they want to be part of culture. But it is, does mean things change. And partly of this is because of the way Silicon Valley has disrupted so many industries recently. And with online models, you have to go direct to the consumer. You can't go via retailers or their relationship. You have to have a very one-on-one -on -one direct relationship. So that means you have to start thinking about your constituency, your consumers as kind of like, in some way, stakeholders. Otherwise, they're going to disappear. So that does happen. I just thought I'd give you Okay, aviation is, we do a lot of work in the aviation industry, I work with all the work engines and various airlines and stuff like that. Aviation is a massive uh, polluter, there's just no getting around it. But what I thought was interesting, and not many people know this, is when you think about alternative futures, this is a story from aviation which is, which is really interesting. And there used to be a lot of plane crashes, a lot of plane crashes. In, in the early 70s, you don't remember how few less people flew in the early 70s. At one point in the early 70s, there were so many plane crashes, Boeing and the industry turned around and went, oh, hang on, if this carries on like this, they'll get to a point, because they knew that the, the graph of use of uh, aviation was going to go up. You know, if this carries on, we're going to get to the point where there's a plane crash every day of the week. And no one's flying anymore. So that's a kind of, they're kind of forced to think of an alternative future of the industry. And just to prove that the industry can change, the change that they had to do in aviation to get this, international agreements, and retraining, new technology, the coordination of that, and it's global. It's, and it's actually, it is actually amazing, it's an amazing human achievement. It got to the point where 2017 was the lowest number of fatalities in civil aviation ever. There's a bit of a blip now because it's gone back in the news because Boeing have had problems with that. Yeah, the new plane and the line crash. That graph's incredible. That, so when we say that industries can't change, they really can. If they know they have to, there's an imperative. And they didn't do this, they, obviously, they didn't obviously shout about this because they just knew it needed something. Sort of it's, it's very interesting how, how, how that happened. Um, I think one of the ones which I think it's worrying is the way social media is kind of works. And social media is kind of is my kind of anti example because on the surface it looks like the circus because you know you share things and oh I get to be a publisher, I get to put my views on to, on to. 
on Twitter or, or you know, I can just get, I can start a business and put it on Amazon or I get to share the world, all the world's life. But I think these companies are really linear in the way they think. I think they're very extractive. I think they, they kind of, the, the kind of psychology is to start a dominate market and then just sit on it. And now I'm stuck with these absolutely enormous, very, very, very powerful companies, which I, and they almost have a, I think they have almost a mercantilist view of the audience, of the consumer. It's almost like, it's almost like the Virginia planters again. It's like they're going to a new found land where you just kind of, this is our to like we've occupied your brain. And thanks very much for doing all the free work and building all our, cons con uh, you know, all our con uh, content and what have you. And it's, and, but what's interesting, I think, is when you see the, the, the resistance to some of this, it's coming literally from inside the companies. The, you know, the people join Google and they're like, oh, we're not going to be Google. And then you're like, oh, hang on a minute. Or we have five guys and all that kind of stuff. So it's very interesting the way that I think you look on these companies and monoliths, but they're not. I mean, they behave in very different ways, and there's nuances and subtleties inside them. And there are arguments won on one day and lost on another day. I think this is a, it's a constant process of keeping them uh, doing the better thing all the time. And I just thought that was really interesting where social media is very different. Another thing is like, I've worked a bit in sports marketing, and there's a very funny story uh, about Liverpool was bought, what's this person saying? Um, but Liverpool was bought by an American company and they put the prices up and the fans went nuts. And the fans were in these really creative things where they, the price of tickets was £77 and it was just way too much to most people in Liverpool would have thought. So what they did is all the fans got together and they created a union. They called it the Spirit of Shankly. So they kind of went, what are we going to do? We're going to create a union, the fans, why not? And, uh, and they started representing, they got representation at the club. And the way they got the club's attention is they did these brilliantly creative protests where they all left at 77 minutes on television <laughs> and walked out, and there were literally thousands of them. And obviously, the, the man, the American owners were like, mm, this doesn't look good on global television. So they, had to sort of, they had to drop the prices, said sorry, and that whole idea was you're treating us as badly as customers. And, that, and uh, I go on to rounds about this all the time. This, it, you can't treat people as badly as customers. They have to be more than transactions. Because they're still your supporters. And if they're not there, it's not going to carry on. But it's just really interesting. And um, I work a bit with F1, which is another one, which is you know, not a good pollution one. And though, <laughs> though, the thing that's very interesting about F1 is they, the intense uh, competition in F1 has meant that hybrid engines are, they went from 75% uh, thermal efficiency down to, uh, the, they went down to 50, uh, sorry, they went from 30 to 50% thermal efficiency. So in the time they've had hybrid engines, which is since 2006, they've vastly improved how effective hybrid engines are. And that does kick off into the next generation, BMWs and so on and so forth. But what they do is, uh, when you think about fans, uh, there's a new uh, marketing director in charge of that woman who's changed lots of things. She got rid of the group girls, she's opening the sports up and stuff. And one of the things that they did is they create this kind of fan, almost like a fan parliament, where they, people can contribute and the off the back of Reddit and stuff like that. And they've actually changed, and they've changed some of the regulations and the rules of the, of the racing to make it more fan friendly, which is a really interesting idea that, you know, maybe there's other ways of representing and other ways of having a democracy with brands, you know. And I think we're, you're going to see more and more of this going on because I think they, they, they have to be more transparent and more kind of accountable brands. And there's a massive piece of Edelman, which Edelman and a massive PR company. They did a piece of research, only came out this year, which I mean, I'll share it with John and look. And they say 64% of consumers around the world will choose switch, avoid, or boycott a business based on its stand on political and social issues. That's, I mean, that's a, this is really interesting. So I think what you have and what you're saying, and it's because of things like circular thinking, about the economy, is it, it, it's kind of become, consumerism is going to become political, and there's just no way around it. And I think because there's been a kind of awakening, a re, 
partly because of safety, partly because of past 2008, and you were saying that your response to Madrid was partly on the back of you know, economic problems and stuff like that. And I think uh, brands really have to pay attention to this. And then I think the next generation, they're all, I mean, you've already, I've already seen, like, for instance, my kids not interested in social media in a way that people 10 years old are not, which is not, they're interested in messaging with each other, but not social media, it's really odd. It's just like, things, things change all the time. And I think this is, I think this is kind of a cause for optimism. And Nike, who obviously you all know what the start was, because uh, I'm about to be watching them all the time. <laughs> this is really, really interesting. That, that, I mean, given the culture wars in America, to make that kind of stand is really significant. They think it's made them loads of money. I mean, they literally, they're, they're totally straight up about it, they're like, it's increased our sales loads. But it doesn't, I don't think, I think it sort of feels authentic because they've got a history of doing this, because they've got a history with the athletes, because of the story when they did it. But they're looking after their constituents to be like, you know, who buys Nikes in America? In America, it's really, really important. So they're like, we're part of the community now, we're not apart from it. We're in a sacred home with people and their views and points of view. So I think we're going to see more of that sort of stuff. And some brands are going to be really, really uncomfortable doing this sort of thing, some are not. But I think it might become more and more uh, normal behaviour for brands, which is, is, is really fun.